You are listening to the Freight Buyers Club, a home for those interested in international trade, shipping, procurement, logistics, and air freight. In fact, all things supply chain in the Americas, Asia, and beyond. This podcast is brought to you by your host, Mike King, and produced in partnership with Demurco Express Group, a global 3PL that specializes in managing logistics to, from, and within the Asia Pacific region. Hello all, my name is Mike King and you are listening to the Freight Buyers Club. And this podcast is for you if you're partial to some chat with thought leaders in the world of international commerce, procurement, container shipping, logistics, rail, trucking or air freight. And how politics, regulations and trade agreements are changing the business environment for companies that rely on global supply chains. We'll be keeping a particularly close eye on that trans-Pacific trade lane from Asia to the Americas, and we'll explore how global supply and demand in freight markets impacts pricing and capacity. Big thanks to Demerco Express for supporting this podcast, which you can find on your platform of choice, including Spotify, Amazon, and Apple. And you'll also find all episodes at thefreightbuyersclub.com, where you can subscribe and receive each episode direct to your inbox. In this inaugural episode, I'm delighted to welcome two of the big hitters of US shipping and business. If this was music, it would be Page and Plant, but this is logistics. And instead, we have Page and Gold. Paul Page, in fact, editor of the Wall Street Journal's Logistics Report. How are you, sir? I'm good. How are you, Mike? I'm very good. And welcome also to John Gold, Vice President for Supply Chain and Customs Policy the National Retail Federation, the world's largest retail trade association. Hello, John. Hi, Mike. How are you? Excellent. Excellent. I'll push straight on. Guys, so first up, we're going to discuss the U.S. economy. And I think it's fair to say that things have looked better. The U.S. economy added a solid 223,000 jobs last month, coming in above expectations. Now, U.S. production and retail sales have plunged, and this is added to fears that the world's largest economy may already be in a recession. I think we are teetering towards a recession. Now, of course, the fourth quarter number does look pretty good, particularly against the backdrop of an even stronger rise in third quarter. I know an official recession hasn't been declared yet, but I think it's fairly obvious we're in a, a pretty mild one here, maybe in Europe as well. Paul, as those clips bear witness, the US economy is very much front and center to any conversation we have right now about global business or trade, any new announcements from the Fed or on employment or on warehouse data or on growth. We see these debates about where the US economy is. How are you guys, the Wall Street Journal, reporting this? Of course, the US had GDP growth of 2.9% in the fourth quarter. Does that put to bed talk of recession that we heard so much about last year? I mean, how do things stand now as we're looking at 2023? You know, it hasn't it hasn't entirely put that talk to bed. And frankly, I, I'm not entirely sure why that is. I've been a little bit of a kind of an outlier on this uh, over time. During the pandemic, frankly, I've been more optimistic about the economy, partly because, look, we've been in a pandemic. This is an enormous shock. It's a uh, what they call in the earnings reports a one-off situation, a thing, an event that happened. I think the underlying trends in the economy are good. Housing is an issue, housing and construction, and, and there are these dark spots, but we're, we're coming out of it. And I think you saw, for instance, in the recent report from the IMF, uh, the IMF raised its outlook. We saw recent numbers from China with some of their numbers looking better. But I think the underlying trends in the GDP reports, that everyone seems surprised. They were surprised at the third quarter. They're surprised at the fourth quarter. So I'm an optimist. I think the underlying economy is, I don't want to say booming or strong or anything like that. Don't get me wrong, but I think the fundamentals are good. And John, retailers, one of those fundamentals in those fourth quarter numbers was final sales to domestic purchases, which is a pretty key reading for demand. That rose only 0.2% in Q4 and was up just 1.1% in the third quarter. Are retailers feeling confident, pessimistic? How are you feeling yourself? Thanks, Mike. You know, I I think there's important to take a look back at overall retail sales in 2022. While retail holiday sales fell a little bit short of what our prediction was of 6 to 8% growth, we still saw 5.3% growth on the important holiday sales. But we've had 
31 consecutive months of year-on-year growth in retail sales, which has been unprecedented throughout the, the pandemic. We met the yearly forecast that we put out of between 6 and 8%. We came in at about 7% growth for the year. While we closed out 2022 with impressive annual retail sales and respectable holiday season, despite the historic levels of inflation and interest rate hikes to cool the economy, consumers are still shopping. They're shopping in record numbers, and retailers have delivered positive holiday experiences to inflation weary consumers, offering great products at more promotional price levels to fit their stretched budgets. Obviously, there were a lot of concerns going into last year with the inflation, the inventory, high inventory levels, and all the congestion that we were facing. But throughout the year, retailers have kind of met the demand from the consumer and will continue to do so. I think coming into this year, though, there's still a lot of uncertainty about the overall economy, what's going to happen with inflation, what happens with recession or not recession, and at the end of the day, kind of where the consumer is and are they going to continue to spend? Are they going to dip into their savings? Where does it shake out? But I think for the most part, retailers feel pretty good and feel like they're going to be able to deliver on whatever the consumer needs. Paul, you've got something you want to add on that. And you've been looking at the retail sector as well at the Wall Street Journal. Yeah, I think John makes a really good point when he talks about the whole year, because this is something we're hearing as well from the uh, carriers, that we all look at these things in terms of like to like quarter to quarter, year over year growth. But the fact is, Things were spread out during the year, and what we're hearing from carriers at this point is they're reporting their earnings, and as we talk to uh, executives at, at shipping companies, is that a lot of retailers spread out their purchasing and their ordering during the year. And consumers did the same thing. Consumers bought early. So it was really much more of a spread out situation. We didn't have the typical kind of everyone piling in on December 18th kind of buying going on. So I think it's important to think of it in those terms. We can't look at just fourth quarter numbers or December numbers and say, oh my God, people just didn't buy. They bought, they just bought in September, October, November. And I think retailers stocked with that in mind. Mike, if I can add to that, I think Paul's exactly right. I think retailers with all the challenges they were facing in the supply chain certainly brought a lot more product in earlier on, recognizing that we're going to have a longer holiday season where consumers, because of concerns they had over product availability over inflation and everything else, started buying earlier in the season. We've kind of gone away from the peak shipping season where it's August, September, October, and now started happening in June. And I know we'll get into this a little bit later on on kind of why some of those products shipments got moved up, but the retailers are lengthening out their supply chains on kind of when they're bringing the product in. So again, don't just focus on what happened in the fourth quarter because a lot of that stuff was brought in earlier in the season and was bought earlier in the season. Um, we haven't even got all of the data from the carriers out for the fourth quarter, but what was interesting was Hapag's Lloyd's numbers were out and they seem way better than the rest of the market, unless some of those overall market figures aren't 100% correct. So I think we'll only be able to tell as we're a few more weeks into 2023 where that's going. John, just so we can look at some of those well, trade organization numbers, their economists predicted in the fourth quarter that global merchandise trade volumes would grow 3.5% in 2022 but only 1% this year. Now, in terms of US merchandise imports, which is that super key trade across the modes, that's only expected to grow by just 0.8%. What are we looking at in 2023? Where's the NRF projections on imports? We still have these high US inventories, don't we? Well, I mean, it depends upon the category and the retailer as far as where the inventory levels are. There's certainly certain categories that are more impacted than, than others, obviously with the seasonality of certain products, they only sell at certain times during the year. But as far as where we're going to be on import volumes for this year, we don't have our full forecast out for the year yet. We probably won't have that for a few months, but our Google report tracker, our prediction right now through the first half of the year is that import levels will be down from where we've been over the past couple of years, kind of more down around the kind of pre-pandemic levels of volumes which isn't surprising kind of where we are. I mean, again, the 31 plus months of sustained growth that we saw, the volumes that we saw just was not sustainable. I think right now we're looking at, again, kind of the first half of the year, the numbers being down back to your typical growth levels where we were pre-pandemic. And then I think second half of the year, again, everything depends on what happens with the economy, but I think we're looking at volumes to pick up once again for that back half, especially as we're planning for the 2023 holiday season. So we might see a traditional peak season in 2023. You're hoping we'll get seasonality back in container shipping and air cargo. Let's hope so. Let's hope we get some normalcy back into the the whole system. But I think there are a lot of uncertainties that a lot of people are dealing with. 
But I think one of the key issues, we've got to address all the issues that we ran into over the past couple of years on the supply chain. You know, now we've got some room to breathe to deal with those issues. For both of you, I mean, do you think this low demand in the first half, will this allow some of those supply chain bottlenecks to be removed from the system over time? Slightly lower demand, is that what we needed? I think it certainly helps. I mean, look, let, let's be honest. A lot of the challenges that we faced over the past couple of years, the pandemic only further exacerbated. A lot of the challenges were there already. So I think now is the time to really focus in on how do we address those challenges. I think there are some big issues we've got to deal with, information sharing, better planning, better resiliency. And then there are other issues that are more kind of port specific, turn times and, and things like that. So I think hopefully now is a time where we've got some breather room to really dig into those issues and really develop some solutions that can pave a better way for resiliency in the system going forwards. And Paul, your team at the Wall Street Journal, you've been looking at the changing behavior of U.S. consumers, if I might put it like that, particularly in relation to e-commerce. How's that playing out and what, what's your view of the demand situation? Yeah, well, as far as e-commerce, I think we're seeing things sort of go back to normal. You know, it's funny about two years ago, everyone was talking about this as being an entire revolution and it goes along with the idea that the pandemic changed everything and we're kind of ignoring the fact that this is a one-off event. I think e-commerce has certainly gained a lot of, a, a lot of traction. It's clearly a very uh, transformative thing that's going on, but I think we're going back to more normal growth patterns in that area. And it's, as John put it, the return to normalcy. And, and that takes on a, a, a lot of characteristics. We're seeing some of the investments that people made, companies made, look not so great anymore. Even Amazon, Amazon just seemed to be this monolithic monster growing, right? And wait, they're closing warehouses. They're shuttering off part of their warehouses. That's something no one would have thought of two or three years ago. So uh, our return to normalcy on the demand side. Let's look at that supply side then. Tonight, American manufacturers are bringing offshore jobs back to the U.S., hoping to create positions and prevent supply chain disruptions. It's known as reshoring, and it's happening at record pace. The lifting of COVID does not necessarily change or solve China's economic structural problems. It's hard to maintain dynamic growth when your labor force is shrinking. The U.S. and the EU appear to be showing a united front over concerns about their country's reliance on China's manufacturing concerns fueled by China's ties to Russia amid the war in Ukraine. Let me start off with two herbs. Made in America. Uh, yes, as you heard there, we've had a lot of changes in perceptions of different countries these past few years. Obviously, China is a big part of that discussion. For U.S. businesses sourcing in China, they had the trade war, they had higher tariffs, and what almost essentially became a closed economy, or at least one of very limited visibility under zero COVID policy. And then overlaying that, we've had tensions in the South China Sea, and the realization from war in Ukraine that in different parts of the world, countries have very different values and forms of government. I, I think I'm safe putting it that way. Paul, how have you been approaching this yourself from an editorial point of view? this changing landscape from a business and trade perspective, or what's your own views on this? Well, I, the, the role of China in supply chains, we think it's all set. It's set in stone, but it's, it's existed the, the way it has for, I would say 30, 30 years. So yeah, it's transforming and it's transforming in a lot of interesting, non-linear kinds of ways. Obviously there's nearshoring going on. I think we're seeing growth in India. In Vietnam, India particularly is interesting. I'm just seeing a lot of changes with Apple and semiconductor manufacturing and everything. That I think is going to have a profound impact on India, not necessarily this year, but over time. But what that adds up to is, I think, a much more fragmented supply chain. In some cases, like you could say there are two supply chains forming, a kind of traditional, what we've been used to, China-based supply chain. And, you know, what I'll just call prosaically enough, a non-China supply chain. And I think those are playing out in different ways for different products, for sensitive products like uh, semiconductors, solar panels, and, and other kinds of things that have sort of geopolitics behind them. That's the whole different supply chain. If you're doing things like uh, toys and construction materials, then maybe it's not such a strategic issue to source from China. John, post-COVID landscape for retailers, is it about shared values where you source your product or is it about cost and quality? Is that still driving these decisions? 
I think, look, you know, prior to the pandemic and going into the trade war, certainly retailers were looking at diversifying their supply chains for a variety of reasons. For the past 20 plus years I've been doing this, retailers have always looked to, to diversify for a variety of reasons. And certainly the trade war sped up some of that movement, trying to find alternatives to, to China. But I think as many found out, even then and during, during COVID, it, it takes time to, to switch your supply chain. It's not something that can be done overnight. It takes months, if not years, to find new vendors and suppliers that can meet all your, your requirements that you have on quality and quantity, meet any U.S. requirements, product safety requirements that are there, but also making sure you've got the skilled workforce where it needs to be. You've got logistics and infrastructure where it needs to be. And a lot of that still needs to be worked out. I think as you know, one person told me, there's no new China that has all the capacity that China does. So you can't move everything out of China all at once. It takes some time. But I think certainly folks have been looking to diversify, not just because of the tensions with the U.S.-China trade relationship, which I think are going to continue, but also realizing what's happened over the past couple of years with all the supply chain challenges, that you need a more diversified and more resilient supply chain. So not relying on China only is, is really important. So I think folks looking at other countries, other sourcing opportunities in Southeast Asia, a lot of talk of nearshoring, onshoring, but again, you've got to make sure you've got the right mix of products at the right place. You've got the skill, the workforce that can make it and all those other issues. And it just takes time to work through that, but it's happening. And I think you've got certainly some new laws in place that have been passed by Congress, signed by the president, things like the CHIPS Act, which certainly has an impact on the tech sector. You've got the Inflation Reduction Act, which has an impact on sustainability and electric vehicles and things like that. And then you've got certainly an ongoing focus on the U.S.-China trade relationship in general. You've got legislation in place to address issues of forced labor, which is having an impact. And that's not just on China, but that's on anybody that China is providing inputs to as well. We're seeing an impact. So at the end of the day, I think retailers are, are looking to continue to diversify their supply chains and create more resiliency in their supply chains, which is really important at this point in time. So we're talking, what, China plus one, multiple source countries, nearshoring, friendshoring. I think it's a mix of everything. And I think it really depends upon the retailer and what their, their mitigation strategy is and how they want to make sure that they have a, a resilient supply chain. I think one of the big lessons learned is the need for better visibility and better partnerships going forwards. If I can just chime in, it's, it's interesting. You know, I'm just sort of extrapolating from John what John was saying, and I'm wondering what the impact is on the carrier community, because it seems to me just looking as we talk about, you know, I'm calling it fracturing or fragmenting, or John was saying diversifying supply chain and, and sort of a menu, all, all of the above menu of choices. What does that mean for carriers? And it seems to suggest the 24,000 TEU ship going from Shanghai to Los Angeles or Shanghai to, to Hamburg or Rotterdam is less important and less significant. You have to wonder about what that means for capacity decisions by carriers. And I don't know, the economies of scale were still there, but do they matter as much? Do they make that difference? Are there other things that matter? Well, maybe another way of looking at this is which countries are likely to benefit most? Because I think that affects what you're talking about, Paul, which is port rotations, availability of infrastructure. Even you can go as far as say, how does changes in the alliance structure that we've seen recently with the break of the 2M, how does that affect carrier's ability to plan for these more diverse sourcing patterns? I think flexibility is key. I don't think anyone can really say what the 2M breakup means for the future of alliances exactly. I'm sure I, I know what the carriers or what the retailers would like to see, or maybe I can guess, but I think flexibility is key. And the alliances sort of lock up capacity and strategic decision-making in a lot of ways. And I think what carriers need to do, I mean, they, John, correct me if I'm wrong, but what ultimately what you're talking about in diversifying supply chains is, is flexibility on the part of the retailers and carriers and logistics companies, it seems to me would have to respond in flexible ways. No, Paul, I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think, again, one of the biggest lessons coming out of the pandemic is the need for better collaboration and better partnership. So this is where you've got to have the carriers really talking to their clients, their BCOs to understand what these patterns are going to be. And the BCOs need to understand what the availability is for the carriers to respond to the new markets. How are the regular sailings into Vietnam, into India, into Cambodia? You know, if we're looking to, again, I know it's going to be a big focus on Africa. What does the Africa trade look like? And again, if we're talking near shoring, what does that look like in Central America? So 
I think having those ongoing discussions, understanding what the shifting trade is going to look like and how can the carrier community respond to where the needs are going to be, I, I think is really important. I want to come back to that shipper carrier relationship, if I may, in a moment. But just finally, in this section, does it matter who produces these products? What I mean by that is, does the nationality of the company matter or is it just where they're based? And I ask this because you see a lot of Asian companies, particularly Chinese companies, they are actually moving with their customers to these other countries. I don't think the nationality matters. I think what matters is that you're working with your suppliers that meet all of your requirements, that adhere to your standards, meet your what you need in place. We certainly know that there are a lot of Chinese manufacturers that are moving into Southeast Asia, into Central America and elsewhere. But I think, again, ensuring that they meet all of your different requirements, your, your CSR, sustainability, all that kind of stuff, meet the requirements of whatever the testing protocols are, whatever the U.S. requirements are, I think is really important. It's not just about finding the lowest cost anymore. It's making sure you've got the right partner to make the right product, which is important. And again, making sure that they adhere to all of your requirements is key to this and making sure you've got a, a partner who is truly a partner and can meet whatever comes next and is able to respond as quickly as possible is key to that. Paul, you mentioned that this varied by sector earlier. Does this vary by sector in terms of this change in geopolitical landscape in terms of how American multinationals source or which companies are their partners and what's the nationality of those companies in terms of how government views what American multinationals do? Do you ever get that sense? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it matters. And John mentioned the, uh, some of the lawmaking things that have been going on. What matters, it's not so much the view of the government, but the regulations that may be behind them and the potential regulations that may be behind them. There are reputational issues with sourcing from the Xinjiang region in China, for instance. But ultimately, what matters is if customs is going to hold up your shipment of clothing if it comes from there. And if customs does that, again, the regulations matter. The government actions matter. The CHIPS Act matters. We've seen investment coming into the U.S., for instance, based entirely on the subsidies that are available over um, solar manufacturing and electric vehicle battery manufacturing. So, the, yeah, that, I, I think it matters. Yeah, there are certainly more critical tech sectors and other sectors that where it's a much bigger issue. But I think the challenge they're going to face, though, is the raw materials and where are the raw materials coming from? They're very limited as far as where they can get certain raw materials. So it's going to take time to develop those specialized supply chains. Paul is correct noting that you've got a lot of big announcements of chip manufacturing moving back here to the United States. But again, it's going to take some time to get those plants and factories up and running. And again, trying to find the skilled workforce as well is a critical part of that. We're having labor shortages already. That's going to be a big part of getting any manufacturing back here to the U.S. is making sure you've got the right skilled workforce working in those areas. Yeah, if I can just interject, you talk about raw materials and there are a lot of moves around the world to find rare earths, with, which go into a lot of technology uh, materials products. And there are attempts to mine those in places like Australia and Canada and, it, and in the U.S. But of course, I think some enormous share of the refining capacity for those rare earths is in China. So yeah, we're talking about multi-year, if not multi-decade kind of shifts going on here. So big changes come into many economies and to the flow of trade, but this is a long term process. John, you mentioned their labor shortages. So let's turn now to labor's or at least let's turn to unions. But first, a quick message. This podcast is proudly produced in partnership with Demerco Express Group, a trusted provider of global shipping and contract logistics services in Asia, Europe, and North America. Demerco's particular strength is in Asia, where it gives shippers the freight capacity and local market expertise to streamline freight movements to and from the region, particularly for trans-Pacific lanes. With 130 forwarding and logistics locations across China, India, and Southeast Asia, Demerco connects Asia with the world like no other global 3PL. You are listening to the Freight Buyers Club. West Coast shipping unions have started negotiations for dock workers at 30 ports. That includes two of the nation's busiest in Los Angeles County. Well, from one coast to another, U.S. importers having deja vu. Shipping container backups now being triggered on the East Coast, while the West Coast is still trying to get back on track. At the Port of Los Angeles, cargo has dropped between 20 and 25 percent in recent months, shifting over to the East Coast and some other ports as well. As you heard there, we are talking unions, or rather 
union action in the transport industry. John, people are saying that the threat of strikes by US West Coast workers or simply the threat of lower productivity at those terminals, that that's been driving this shift that we've seen the last year or so of cargo entering the US from the West Coast to the East and the Gulf Coast, where we've seen a lot of poor congestion. Are you expecting retailers to continue preferring the East Coast long term or is this all down to a new deal being signed between the PMA representing port interests and the ILWU representing West Coast dockers? And then everything goes back to normal. Cargo starts being funneled back through the West Coast again. Look, I think there were a number of issues that factored into the shift of cargo away from the West Coast last year. Obviously, the incredible congestion that, that we were facing early on, folks had to look for alternatives. So the shift to the East Coast and Gulf Coast wasn't surprising. On top of that, certainly the expiration of the contract on July 1 certainly was another factor because I think everybody has a very short memory of what's happened in previous labor negotiations. Back during the 2014-2015 the contract negotiations, there was significant disruption that we saw up and down, down the coast. We had to have the administration step in to help the parties get to a final deal, but that certainly had an impact on operations. And then obviously, you know, it looks back to what happened in 2002 with the 10-day lockout and the damage that caused. I think recognizing that we can't put ourselves in that kind of situation again, retailers and other importers availed themselves of shifting their cargo and just the uncertainty of not having one, not having a contract in place and the potential for any kind of disruption from either party uh, continues to be, be a concern. We had called upon both parties early on last year to sit down early because we knew that there were significant issues that needed to be worked through and waiting until the last minute, we didn't think was, was right. There were some hope back last summer when there was an early announcement of a potential deal on at least the healthcare provisions, but we haven't seen any progress since. And so I think a lot of retailers, again, and others are watching closely. And until there's a, a final contract in place that provides the kind of sustainability that folks are looking for, you're not going to see a whole lot of shifting back until that happens. But it's certainly is top of mind. And there are other issues certainly that we've been facing. We had the railroad, potential railroad strike issue late last year. And then we've got the Teamster UPS negotiations occurring this summer. So there's a lot of potential for disruption in, in the supply chain going forwards. We hope it doesn't happen, but folks have to plan accordingly. Paul, how have you been covering the potential risk levels from union action that we're seeing? I mean, obviously we've got rising rates of inflation. So we're not just talking in the US where work workers aren't very happy. Also, labor shortages add to that risk level. How are you covering that in the Wall Street Journal? Yeah, I mean, look, it's it's going on, frankly, everywhere. I mean, John, you brought up the West Coast ports, and John, just I see, went right to UPS as well. Yeah. And you, uh, I think we may be talking from the United Kingdom, and the the UK has had its share of, of labor issues, particularly involving transport workers. We're seeing labor issues in France. So it's got sort of a question of you can run, but you can't hide. I mean, I would wonder what's going on as we have the ILWU talks dragging on there. They're in danger actually of bleeding into the ILA talks on the East Coast as well. And I think generally the outlook for that is a bit more sanguine than it is on the West Coast, but that's still hanging out there. So it's, it's a real cloud. And ultimately I think it calls for, and it's, it's the same theme I, I had earlier when we were talking about nearshoring, I think when John talks about people being concerned about the uncertainty, it calls for flexibility. It calls for people being shippers and carriers as well, having systems in place and having relationships in place and having the distribution centers, say on the East coast or on the Gulf coast, having infrastructure in place that allows them to pivot and respond. And the bigger retailers, the bigger shippers, importers are the ones who are, are better able to do that generally. We saw last year we, this front loading of cargo. Now, it wasn't just due to this threat at the West Coast and that 1st of July deadline. There was other factors involved. But if there's not an East Coast deal early with the ILA, is that a threat? Will retailers preempt any failure to come to a deal? Or are we looking too far ahead? That, I think, does that deal finish in September 2024? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think we've still got some time on the ILA negotiations. And I think... There have been some positive signals thus far out of the, both the ILA and USMX that they're potentially sitting down to talk about an early extension of the contract, a multi-year extension, which I think would provide, again, that stability that many are looking for. They certainly have gained over the past year or so with the volumes they've seen. I mean, New York, New Jersey's taken over as the kind of the top port 
in the U.S. where it's typically L.A. and Long Beach. Obviously, you keep combining L.A. and Long Beach, they're still number one, but when you separate them out, New York, New Jersey certainly has gained, as well as every other port along the East Coast and Gulf Coast. You look at some of the numbers from Baltimore and South Carolina, Houston, I mean, they, they were gangbusters. And they don't want to lose that cargo. So they're going to do everything they can to ensure that they can maintain it. And I think, as Paul noted, one of the considerations for retailers is what their network looks like and being close to the customers. That's where I see building up new distribution center fulfillment centers to meet the rising population on East Coast and Gulf Coast. So that certainly is a critical part of this. The other piece of it too, as we noted, it wasn't just the, the labor talks that folks shifted away from California or the West Coast in general. But looking at the business environment in California now as well is certainly on, on top of everybody's mind. Looking at things like AB5 and the potential impact on drivers, the clean truck rules, new environmental requirements on warehousing or not being able to build new warehousing. All of that certainly comes into play as retailers are evaluating their supply chains and looking at where does it make the most sense to bring their, their merchandise through and meet the consumer. Yeah, and just to add to that, there's been a, a big macro change in the, in the sort of balance, the economic balance in the U.S. towards the Southeast manufacturing and population growth is going to the Southeast and to what extent that changes your decisions on shipping is interesting, but a lot of companies are finding it beneficial to ship into Houston and Mobile and Charleston, and Savannah, as you say, John. And so, uh, I think that's a big trend, the sort of manufacturing shift to the Southeast. And this change in U S logistics networks or this shift, how have trucking and rail networks being adapting to this? Is this happening quick enough? Or is this where we've seen some of these delays in the system? And Paul, also just to throw in another question, you guys have, you've also noticed a, a shift in air cargo as well as this manufacturing supply chains alter slightly. Yeah, indeed. I think a lot more infrastructure needs to match this movement. There is infrastructure going on. A lot of it isn't necessarily big projects, but we're talking about rail infrastructure, rail growing out of uh, Savannah, rail connections and highway connections out of Savannah and Charleston, rail connections and, and also highway connections out of Texas. Uh, a lot of that is being added sort of in incremental ways. And I think it's important and that's going to help adapt and shift the flow of goods. John, would you agree with that? No, I, I completely agree. I think you've got to have logistics network to meet the, the needs. So I think building the infrastructure is a key part of that but making sure you've got the equipment availability as well. I mean, that certainly was one of the biggest issues we saw last year, the whole issue of the chassis and availability of chassis to so make sure you've got the right equipment in the right place to meet the need. So I think, again, here is where partnering and having that collaboration is important so that you are trucking, rail, air partners all understand kind of what shift is happening and what you're going to need to achieve that shift. It's not just building out the, the roads and network, but it's having better collaboration, having better information sharing is critical. Yeah. And you mentioned the air cargo, Mike, it's interesting with all the manufacturing moving to the Southeast or growing much more in the Southeast, air cargo operations are advancing in some of those places to accommodate that. There's a longstanding business in Huntsville, but there are a lot of places in South Carolina, for instance, that are seeing growth. I think the air cargo operators and, and logistics providers are following the manufacturers into that region. Okay, let's look at the cost of freight. The container shipping cycle appears to be coming down from its highs. Soaring inflation and looming recessions in some economies have lowered demand. Global shipping operator DP World expects freight rates to fall by as much as 20% this year as demand from consumers begins to slow down. I guess, guys, that one of the big boons for U.S. retailers and U.S. businesses in general is that the cost of most forms of transport has now returned to pre-COVID levels or thereabouts. Just take the cost of shipping from Asia at the height of the shipping boom into the U.S. West Coast. You're looking at $15,000 or, or so, it's 40 foot container from Asia, and that's now down $2,000 or even lower, I'm hearing, on that spot market. Obviously, you've got some people who are still tied into higher contracts, but that will evolve as the year progresses. Air cargo rates have also come down on the same trade. Paul, this is all good news for everyone in the U.S. that relies on those supply chains, isn't it? U.S. businesses happy? I hope they're happy. You know, they don't sound that happy <laughs> all the time. I've been listening to some earnings calls. Maybe uh, they don't sound very thrilled about it, but we're seeing the impact. We're seeing the impact. We had a story this morning that Whole Foods is asking its suppliers to cut their prices to Whole Foods and it transportation costs are part of that. And they want to, you know, the retailers 
in this case, I know John may have some constraints here. Maybe they don't sound so happy, but is this the first time that they've actually known what the cost of freight was <laughs> on those earnings calls? Yeah, that was actually one of the interesting things that came along early in the pandemic. We had CEOs and CFOs suddenly talking about price per TEU on particular trade lanes, things you've never really heard in earnings calls before and talking about the yield of their trucking operations and all of that. So it certainly raised that profile. I, and you know, it's interesting, the, the chief supply chain officers that were getting beat up and we had a front page story a couple of years ago, I remember about that. And all these companies were just lamenting this, the horrors that were going on. And now these chief supply chain officers and logistics managers, are, I'm sure, I, I hope, are walking into the CFO's office demanding bonuses and saying, hey, I'm a hero. Look at me. I look at what I did. I just cut our transportation costs 80%. How about that? At least I hope that's that. Yeah, well, I mean, they, they are the heroes now. I mean, I wonder how many of them have got bonuses for getting costs down. Or is it being passed along to the consumer? Well, there is that too. John, is it being passed along to the consumer? And how are retailers feeling about these lower costs? Do you, what sort of sense are you getting? I mean, look, the, it wasn't just about the cost of moving the container. I think you had every other aspect of the supply chain became more expensive from the cost of raw materials, transportation, labor, energy, warehousing. Everything became more expensive. And that obviously led to, to price increases. Retailers where they can certainly are going to pass along the, the savings back to consumers. But the other challenge too was the, the millions and millions of dollars that retailers and others were paying in these fees due to congestion, you know, detention to merge fees where companies pre-pandemic hadn't paid anything. We're now paying millions of dollars for issues that were out of their control. They couldn't get containers. The containers were buried in the bottom of a pile, but yet they had to pay millions of dollars to get the containers freed that companies hadn't paid before. So that was a significant wake-up call for a lot of folks. So I think seeing those issues get resolved certainly has been good. We're now in the process of seeing a lot of companies go back to carriers and try to renegotiate based upon the new rates that they're, they're seeing. So are folks happier with the lower rates potentially? But I think the other issue too is we've got to get the service back in line as well. While you're seeing lower rates, you're seeing a whole lot more blank sailings as well, which has an impact on the system. You know, there's a lot of issues that need to get worked through. And this must be an interesting negotiation for them. And they've had these years of poor service. They've had these detentions and mortgage charges. We've had lines not meeting contractual terms. And a lot of these shippers have actually signed new contracts at much higher rates. It's now their turn to turn around and say, actually, do you know what? Maybe we want to change these contracts. <laughs> Especially now that you guys are all competing for cargo a bit more ruthlessly than you have been. Is that how it's going, John? Yeah, I mean, look, I think retailers certainly know who their, their true partners are and will continue to work with them. But I think, again, working through the issues, not just on the rates, but also on service, that is critical. And again, being able to respond to when there are these crisis situations is incredibly important. So I think there are a lot of tough discussions, tough negotiations are going to be ongoing, especially as we get into contract season coming up. But it, it's important to work through these issues. And I think retailers, again, it's not just the cost, but it's also the service part of this that folks want to see the follow through on and make sure that you can get that container when you need it. Paul, do you get any sort of sense about how these shipping lines are viewed now by U.S. business, by U.S. corporations? What's the uh, people thinking? Well, these guys aren't reliable partners. I go back to actually what John said very early in our discussion, where he talked about a return to normalcy and it's a return to normal there. It's a, uh, often combative, heated kind of relationship and each side is trying to get what they want. I think. The shippers, the importers want lower costs and the carriers are trying to maximize their yield. I, I see interesting dynamics right now going on in, in some of the carriers going deeper into logistics services. And I think that's a long-term view. That's a big strategic shift by the carriers that recognizes that this sort of volatile relationship that is the normal state of play in carrier shipper relations, uh, really isn't, isn't a great long-term business model for them. And I'm interested to see how that plays out. I don't have a crystal ball, but I think it will continue to be what we recognized before the pandemic as a coming bad relationship. Maybe just finally, John, do you think that certainly the carriers can do a lot more and should do a lot more to provide a more stable service with better reliability, with better customer service? Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I think so. Again, this is where I keep throwing out the word partnership. It's critical. There's gotta be better collaboration among all parties. And I think just to kind of add to, to Paul's point there, one of the things that certainly 
over the past couple of years, both Congress and administration certainly paid a lot of attention to supply chain issues and have focused in on, on the ocean carriers, both on import and export related issues. I don't think that's going to go away. I think there's going to be continued focus on the supply chain in general, but also on the carriers, especially as you see implementation of the Ocean Shipping Reform Act and how that goes forwards. But as Paul noted, buying up some of these other services as well, I think some folks are going to be looking at that and how that impacts the supply chain too. There certainly will be some potential regulatory focus on, on these issues. We're talking about what we've learned from the COVID years. So finally, for both of you, what would be your top three, but if you say a few more, I don't mind, takeaways from the COVID years in terms of international trade or what we've learned about how the business of freight, logistics, shipping and supply chains has been impacted by this pandemic. Are there any positives we can take away? I mean, I think, look, first and foremost, I think everybody recognizes the supply chains are, are complex. The fact that you saw a supply chain on the nightly news for two years, folks understood what the challenges were. But I think many of the issues that we saw, especially related to congestion, existed prior to the pandemic, which is something we've continued to talk about. They were only further exacerbated, but we need all stakeholders to come together to work now to address these issues, to ensure that we're better prepared for whatever comes next and create more resiliency in the system. So I think that's first and foremost. I think second, despite all the challenges we faced, you know, retailers remain resilient in meeting the needs for their customers. They continue to focus on building more resiliency and visibility into their supply chains. We talked about early on the fact that retailers, you saw the boom in e-commerce, that was response to folks being at home with nothing to do, but buy stuff online essentially. But for those retailers that were not deemed as being critical to implement programs such as buy online, pick up in store, curbside pickup, those kind of investments that they hadn't planned for, for a couple of years, but now are critical. Consumers still like to do that. So the resiliency of the retail industry certainly has been front and center throughout this pandemic. And then finally, partnerships and communication are critical, both internal and external to the organization. I think that is one of the biggest lessons learned as we kind of highlighted the fact that CEOs, CFOs were now talking supply chains on every one of their earnings calls. The fact that supply chain was at every part of the leadership discussions and throughout the organization and have better alignment so folks understand what's happening at any point in time and can work to address whatever situation arises. So having that communication internally to know what your plans are, but also having the right partners externally, whether it's vendors, transportation providers, whoever, that can implement your plan is critical. And I think that's something that retailers are gonna to continue to push on. Paul, what's your three big takeaways aside from the obvious elephants in the room, which is that COVID has been brilliant for the WSJ logistics report, no doubt. Oh, well, I, I'm not sure I would, I would say that because I'm not going to go there with that. But I, I would say, I mean, that we learned that the, the supply chains and the, the supply chain, if you can broaden it out, and supply chains, the smaller ones, the, the ones that make up the bigger supply chain, are much more fragile than we thought. And I don't mean that as a negative. To me, that, again, I, as a reporter, look, I'm a journalist. John knows I hate to be positive. It's the last thing I want to do. But, <laughs> but Look, it's a miracle. It all worked. And I understand, I know what happened to the, to the evergreen ship. And I know that you went to the store and there was no toilet paper and, and all those things happened. But that, to me, that draws attention to the fact that we expect that to happen every day. And when it didn't, it really called attention to what a miracle the whole supply chain is. And I hate to be too positive or poetic even, but it all worked. You know, I had an interesting conversation over where we were talking about covering the development of the vaccine. We were all coming together as a team and everyone's talking about the way this is made and how Pfizer is going to do this and that. And then everyone looks at me like, well, how are the carriers, you know, what are the problems with the carriers and how this is going to be moved? And I said, they'll move it. They do it. They do it all the time. And there will not be a problem with shipping the vaccine. That's not where the issue is going to be. Right. And that proved to be correct. I mean, everyone in the room raised their eyebrows and said, what are you talking about? But it worked. And I, I think by and large, yeah, we all point to these things that happened like the, uh, the Suez canal incident and, and various things. And certainly there were enormous numbers of strains, but you know, the entire world shut down over a potentially humanity devastating virus. And if you think the economy and everything was going to move normally, that's really delusion. The supply chain worked.
And it's a miracle. I think it's a miracle. I think, I mean, it's why I cover this stuff. It's a miracle to watch it. It's incredible to see. And it worked for all the things that were stuck at the port of Los Angeles. Things were also moving through there. You know, trucks were moving. Truck drivers were delivering goods, even though the truck stops in, in parts of the U.S. were entirely shut down. People weren't allowed in. And yet things kept moving. And I, I think that's, to me, that's sort of a big, I guess, one big takeaway. I completely agree with Paul on that. The, the fact that we had record setting volumes coming through our ports, despite all the challenges we faced, we had 31 months of consecutive growth in the retail sector. Things worked. Despite all the challenges we faced, things worked, the supply chain worked, but we've got to address these problems for the future. Because again, we saw what happens when things break down and we've got to create more resiliency. So yeah, it, it, it worked. We've got to find a better path forwards to ensure we don't have complete shutdown and chaos when the next event happens. And if we didn't have any shutdowns or breakdowns, we'd have less stories to cover, I think, Paul. Yeah, you see, I mean, you see the difference here. You see the journalist being very positive and upbeat and the business guy is, is it's like throwing water on it. No, no, you're wrong here. It's wrong. It's all wrong the wrong way around. <laughs> Well, it was, it was a nice way to finish the podcast. Paul Page, editor of the WSJ Logistics Report of the Wall Street Journal, and John Gold, Vice President for Supply Chain and Customs Policy at the National Retail Federation. Thanks very much for joining me today on the Freight Buyers Club. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Mike. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Freight Buyers Club, produced in partnership with the Demerco Express Group. Please subscribe and follow on your platform of choice or sign up for delivery to your inbox at thefreightbuyersclub.com. This podcast wouldn't have been possible without the fantastic editing of Karen Ball and Tom Matthews. And finally, thank you all for listening. The next episode will be with you soon. 